know, some heavy, heavy things on our hearts uh, this morning. And uh, one other heaviness, although this one uh, we, we can celebrate a little differently when it's uh, celebrating the life of somebody who has uh, passed this life to the next, but somebody who has lived life to the full. And it was this week that the news came out about Burt Bacharach's passing. And uh, that touched me in a particular way as we're in the midst of these sermons that are themed under uh, the, the monikers of one of his best known songs. If you're struggling to remember uh, of the many, many hits that Burt Bacharach was uh, the, either the writer and or composer of, he uh, wrote, I say a little prayer for you. I'd planned to sing some of these for you, but with my, <laughs> with my infection and my hearing, it's not going to work so well. When I, in the morning, I wake up. And, uh, but he, but he, he, he wrote that. He wrote, walk on by. He wrote, I'll never fall in love again. He wrote, raindrops keep falling on my head. That's what friends are for. And of course, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And, and a whole bunch of other songs. And, uh, and lived a life really to the full and, and provided so much joy through music to this world. Um, I want to spend just a minute, though, with uh, what the world needs now. Uh, I did a little bit of looking into the backstory on this, and Burt Bacharach came to love this particular song so much that it was often the closer for his concerts over the last 20 years of concerts he would do. That to him, he felt like this was sort of a pinnacle piece of what he had written. And what's interesting, he did this in a tandem with another gentleman writing this song, and this song took three years to write. And when you listen to it, it is a very simple song. And you might listen to it and go, three years? And, uh, you know, people who write, whether it be songs or any other form of, uh, of creative work, they'll tell you that very often the most simple things are the most difficult ones to put together. And so it was in 1962 that the seed of this song started to germinate. And these two uh, partners started working on it. And they just they couldn't get it where they felt it flowed in the way they wanted, but they had, they had the hook and they had the idea and, and they kept working on it. And it wasn't until 1965 that the song was, uh, in their minds, perfected. And then Jackie DeShannon put it to, uh, to, to a song with her voice and they put it on this album. And uh, all of them were expecting for this song to sort of be uh, almost like a hidden or forgotten track on this album. They didn't think it would catch on, and part of it is because they, would, they anticipated that the, the real heart of this song would be sensed by the people hearing it, and they would reject it, because the heart of this song was in the subtext of the Vietnam War. It, it, was, uh, it was trying to address not only the literal conflict happening uh, around the world in Vietnam, but the conflict at home as well, and the pain and the, the disagreements and the conflict in all those places. And these songwriters just had this urging within them to put to song something that offered some simple word of hope for where there might be an answer for all that was troubling. And, uh, and sure enough, it caught on. And, and, uh, and so many sort of sensed through that song, yeah, you know, it, it is overly simplistic, isn't it? But, but isn't it true that the most simple things at their core can be the most complex and world-changing kind of thing. So what the world needs now is love, sweet love. So we started this off. We're going to use this as sort of the umbrella of three weeks of sermons. And last week was the first one. And we started with Zephaniah 3.17. And really the emphasis of that message was about God's, God's love, God's affectionate love for us. You know, it was like the heartbeat, boom, 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 boom. And really trying to come to grips with Boy, God feels something about you and me and each of the people in this world. And, uh, you know, I've got music on the brain. If last week was all about uh, you got me feeling emotions deeper than I ever dreamed of, this week is going to be show me love and what it's all about. You know, we're still going to be talking about love and God's love for us, but we move, uh, we, we, we sort of move from emotional affection into, okay, now, now how does that love express itself? You know, when it comes to love, the heart and the hand operate in concert, one without the other. Doing acts of love without a heart of love is, is hollow, and ultimately it's, it's felt and it's experienced that way by others. 
And, and by the same token, just feeling love or even saying like, no, 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 I love you, I love you, but never doing anything that corresponds with that love, that also has a hollowness to it, an emptiness that somebody who is receiving or supposedly the object of that love uh, knows that, that what they're experiencing is not the fullness of love. The good news for us is that God is always about the fullness of love and that what God feels and what God articulates, God means and God acts on. Uh, it was Martin Luther, uh, the, the historic Luther from hundreds of years ago, who said this about the nature of the way that God expresses love. Martin Luther said that the, the very nature of God is to have love and to turn it outward. And that as human beings who our inclination is to have love and turn it into ourselves, the closer we get to God's transformative love, the further we go on this journey of faith in life, the more that God is working with us, that we would come to our identity as it is in the image of God, that we too would turn our love outward, that the love that exists within us wouldn't stay in us, but it would be shared and expressed with others. So scripturally, what I want to do, and this is going to be easy for you to remember, if you remember, John, uh, <laughs> if you remember Zephaniah 317 from last week, and I know many of you do, I know many of you do, you're like, wait a minute, is he messing with us? This is Zephaniah, I don't even know if this is in the Bible, it's in there. Zephaniah 317 was last week, it was about God smiling over us and exulting over uh, the people of this world and singing over them and how the people of this world bring God's heart joy. We move from that to now John 3, 16 and 17. So you have Zephaniah 3, 17, John 3, 16 and 3, 17 as we explore God's love in action, God's gift of tangible love to the world through Jesus Christ. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send, this is verse 17, indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We ask that God would add blessing and understanding to this, the reading aloud, the hearing, and most importantly for us, that God would add a blessing to the living out, to the turning outward of love that we find in these words in this scripture. So the, the first thing I want to do is keep in mind with these I iconic words of the gospel, words I'm guessing many of you could re repeat yourselves, at least the 316 part, maybe for some of you 317. But the context of these words is Jesus having a conversation in the middle of the night? Whoa. If that's okay. It happens. Next time, if it's a Burt Bacharach uh, ringtone, we'll be much, you know, if it's going to be one of those songs, we'll let you play it the whole way through. But the, the context of John 3 is that Jesus is having this conversation in the middle of the night. A Pharisee named Nicodemus has come to seek him out in the evening. And you can remember that, Nick at night. And uh, Nicodemus and Jesus, <laughs> Nicodemus and Jesus have this unusual conversation. It's not necessarily the content of the conversation that's unusual, although it is, I mean, it, it's, it's big time. There's a reason why John 3.16 had become for so many people, for so many centuries, sort of the glue of the gospel. It's an important conversation, but even the nature of the conversation itself, having it is unusual. For, fair, for a Pharisee, Nicodemus, to come approach Jesus just one-on-one, -on -one, in the context of all that we read about Jesus, we read a lot about Jesus and the Pharisees, but it's almost always this um, uh, group of, of people talking with Jesus, not in good faith, but in this conflict sort of way and trying to ensnare Jesus or trap him or argue with him. Nicodemus doesn't approach Jesus in that way. It's one-on-one -on -one and it's earnest. And it's very unusual that it's at night. I mean, in the ancient world, in Jesus' time, for most of the people, boy, when the sun went down, it's time to batten down the hatches. I mean, it's, 
This is getting to be about bedtime, and everybody retreats back to where they can find not only shelter and the, the time to sleep, but safety in doing so. But Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and we don't know if this is because Nicodemus doesn't want his friends to know. Like, maybe it's embarrassing. Hey, you know, <laughs> they're going to look at me a little strange if I come to Jesus in good faith, and I say, hey, I've been listening to you, and I've been watching you, and I don't understand everything that you're saying, but I want to understand it. I want to see fully what it is that you're doing. Uh, his friends may not have been keen on that, and so he thinks, oh, I'll go at night when nobody can see me. Or it could be that that's not the motivation. The, the reason is that Jesus is so swarmed by so many people during the day that Nicodemus thinks this is my chance to be able to have kind of one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. I need to find him when nobody's around. What, whatever the circumstances are that lead to it, Nicodemus is, is having one of these, what he thinks is private conversations that will end up being marked uh, and, and read about for thousands of years. And a line within this conversation, again, will be one of those ones that will, will be key in expressing to the, the people of this world, God loves you so much. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in good faith saying, help me connect the dots. I can't quite put them together. Everything I've learned, all the ways that I have framed it, I feel like you're twisting it, Lord. I feel like you're trying to, to get it on the right track and I just can't get it there and I want to. So in John 3, before we get to verses 16 and 17, Nicodemus and Jesus are having a back and forth. Again, it's not a, a conflict one. It's not one where Nicodemus is trying to trick Jesus or vice versa. Nicodemus is saying, help me. And Jesus says, okay, let me help you try to understand. And he explains to him about being born again. And uh, Nicodemus doesn't get it. And he's like, uh, I don't know. What are, you, what are you trying to say? And Jesus says, okay, let me try and put it another way. And they go back and forth. And finally, what we get in verse 16 and 17 is Jesus's attempt at the most simplistic, core truth he can, express uh, what this whole thing is about and what it, what, what it is that God wants to do in the world. He says, let me put it this way. God loves this world so much that that which is closest to God's own heart, God's very self. You know, we understand Jesus as part of the Trinity, existing as part of God before we knew Jesus in physical form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist forever, before and after. And God says, this part of me that is so, so much of who I am, I will offer to the world to live with the world and walk and talk with them and even die with them because I love them that much and I want them to know that love. And then Jesus continues saying that that son came to the world by God's choosing not to condemn the world, not to come and say to the world, hey, the ship is sinking and I just wanted to let y'all know, you're going to drown. You should have listened better. Jesus doesn't come doing that. He doesn't come to condemn and say, shame on you. You got it all wrong. He says, God loves you and wants you to find the way. There's rescue. There is, there is hope and you can find it through me. We, we see in the course of history, whether it's the the history that's narrated through the scriptures or in our own lives and the stories handed down over the generations. We see all these ways in which God gives gifts to the world that, are, that could not be understood as anything other than gifts of love. Out of God's love, God did dot, dot, dot. And in John 3.16, we have this articulation that of all the gifts that God has given this world out of love, there is a the gift the gift of God's own self coming in human form, emptying God's self of all the power and privilege that that would afford to say, I'm going to come be with you, not to hurt you, but to help you, not to shame you, but to save you. So Jesus says this to Nicodemus and Nicodemus, he, he still struggles with it. And he's getting it a little bit better, but boy, he says, this is I don't, I don't have any clue why God would do this. Right? To which I can say, yeah, I, I feel you, Nicodemus. This doesn't make any sense. And, and if you know, the more, I should say, the more that you know about ancient understanding of God 
and, and this is true, although it's not as articulated even in modern day understanding, it's almost always built around the gods are angry at humanity. God is so, God made a huge mistake making you. And Nicodemus is struggling with Jesus saying, God, God didn't make a mistake. God did exactly what God wanted to do. And yes, there have been mistakes that have been made in this world in all sorts of ways that things have gone askew, but God's love perseveres. And there's no lengths that God won't go to to express God's love. It's not just a feeling for God. It's a feeling and an action. God's love for the world is a real thing. Uh, now, as far as I've known the church, and that's you know a span of 45 years, uh, some of you are like, hey, you short timer. Uh, I've got double the years on you. Uh, but, but my experience, and maybe yours too, is that the, the church has really lived in a place of tension about the identity of the church, quote unquote, or even the, the person who loves God, the Christian who follows Jesus, and the world. You know, uh, th there's, there's a couple of scriptures that the way that we sort of hear them and they're framed seem to indicate that there ought to be this hatred of the world. We're told there was a theologian, very influential, I believe it was in the early 1900s, who wrote something about uh, the church ought to be in the world, but not of the world. And the idea is, uh, we, we've struggled as a church with this kind of sense that's put into us by outside forces that says the world is no good. And so shield yourself off from it. The world's going to a place in a handbasket and you don't want to go with it. I'll let you guess what place that is. You know, so wall yourself off. And yet, it's not just in John 3, 16 and 17. It's the narrative of God's mighty acts in Scripture over and over and over again. God wants to express God's love for the world. God wants to save the world. He doesn't want the world to be destroyed by its own hand. He doesn't want to destroy the world. Just, just think about how in these two verses alone, Four times the world, that, that phrasing is used. And it's always used in the context of how much God is crazy about the world and the people within it. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. At the beginning of 3.17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather that the world might be saved. You know, I, boy, there's a lot said to people of faith, whether they be ministers or people in pews or whoever, that, that want to prioritize God's love as the dominating force in this world, saying what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And the, the comeback is, you're just being of the world. You're, you are, you are uh, you're following the world, not God. And I'm like, friends, I know the one who invented love. It's not the world, it's God showing the world love. God loves this world and the people within it. God loves you. And that means, if it's more than just words and affection, that God is patient with the world. That God is gracious with the world. That God is kind with the world. That God is merciful with the world that God is willing to even not keep a record of right and wrong. All these things I'm reading you, these are out of 1 Corinthians 13 about the definition of what love is. And if we believe the scriptures, we believe that God is love, then these are the ways that God loves. And if we believe that Jesus told the truth when he says God loves this world so much, then what it means is God is patient, kind, generous, merciful, doesn't keep a record of wrongs with the world, that God is willing to do anything, even paying the ultimate price to express love so that the world might be transformed by it. God's willing to pray, pay the price in God's love for you, for me, for everybody. You know, I think it's really important and it's part of the call that I feel, one, to be United Methodist, Two, it's part of the joy I feel to have a United Methodist voice in Vero Beach. That part of what we do as United Methodists is we declare to the world 
that God's identity is rooted in love for you, not in condemnation of you. Now, God wants transformation for you, for all of us. But that transformation comes via love, not, not shame, not blame. That God wants a wholeness of life for the people of this world. And that desire that God has for a saving of the lives of people, it overcomes every human-made barrier that we've put up. And we've put up a lot of them. We've put up those barriers regarding race, regarding class, regarding age, regarding identity. You name it, we've said in some form or another, these people are more in and these people are more out when it comes to God's love for them. Nicodemus, let's come back to him real quickly. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a religious leader. This isn't just the Pharisees. This is so many religious leaders throughout time, including today's time, across faith backgrounds and denominations. For, for Nicodemus and for so many others that are religious leaders, the expectation that either has been put on them or they put on themselves is part of my job is to articulate God loves these people and God doesn't love these people. And again, that might be based on where they're from, their background, their ancestry, or what they've done. The, the, the role of the religious leader by many has been to say, in, out. So do what you've got to do to be in. And if you're not in, well, too bad, so sad. When Nicodemus is struggling with what Jesus is offering the world, what he's struggling with is that Jesus is offering God for everybody in the world. And, and we'll come to discover even for Nicodemus and his own doubts about himself being one that God loves. Jesus says, God loves everybody, uh, including you. Not only does God love everybody, but in John 3, 16 and 17, it says that God wants to save everybody. And then we get in English these words, and God wants to give everybody eternal life. Now, now, here's a fun little language thing for you. Eternal, that word, when we think of it in English, when we read it, I, I bet it's almost unanimous uh, across the board that what we have in our mind is, is a chronological, temporal sort of understanding. What it means for life that is eternal means I live this day and this year and the years to come. And even when the end comes for my flesh and bones, that God has made a way that I continue living the years that follow that forever and ever. And no doubt, that is part of the understanding of eternal in, in the way that it's being spoken here, but it's not the only understanding. It's not the complete understanding. The exact same word that we translate as eternal in John 3.16, we translate as abundant numerous other times, including just a few chapters later in John 10.10. 10. Jesus is once again trying to help people get the point, and he says, I have come not to harm you, but like a shepherd with, with their sheep, I have come so that you would have life and that you would have it abundantly. Same word as eternally, abundantly. What it means with a shepherd and sheep, and, and for that shepherd to give his sheep abundant life is safe, is full I mean, you got enough to eat. It, it's, it's a place for you to lay your head. It's, it's comfort for you to know that there are others with you. What God has in terms of love for the world is not simply that those who have found their way into the kingdom would say to the rest of the people, hey, 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 God, God would prefer for you to not you know, drink, smoke, or chew in this life. But if you do, the main thing is that you say this prayer so that there can be eternal life for you. And in the end, you don't just go into the abyss with the bats and the caves and the ragged clothing for eternity, but that you can be somewhere better. The core of the gospel is that God wants abundant and eternal life for the whole world, for mouths to be filled, for hearts to be warmed, for people to be, to be allowed to, to come into their full potential. The, the gospel that Jesus has for Nicodemus is one that changes everything about even right now and for the future. 
It contains a sense of now and what is to be, that there's full life now in the gospel and there's full life forever for every single person. There's a way to experience it. There's a way to share it. There's a way to live in it. And Jesus offered to Nicodemus and offers to us this morning the root of that way. Man, it's complex. Burt Bacharach found that out. Took him three years to try and put pen to paper and play it on a piano about it. It's, it's really tricky, but, but isn't it so simple? The way to find that saving, eternal, abundant love is by living in love. It's by recognizing what the world needs now is love, sweet love. What I need is love, sweet love. And so, Lord, would you grant it that I would know it here, that I would feel it here, that I would live it out here. God loves this world so much. God loves you so much. And lucky for us, God has boatloads of that love to share. Let's pray together. God, it is good for us to struggle with how much you love us and how much you love this world. We can be honest with you like Nicodemus was with Jesus. We can tell you that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us at times, that we don't get all the facets of it. Lord, that we wonder if it really applies to even me. And still, through your gift of love to us in the form of Jesus, you help us to sense your heartbeat of love for each of us. You help us to see the dreams that you have of abundant and eternal life for each of your children. We receive your love today, Lord, the best that we can. And in the receiving of it, we are thankful. We ask that you help us to turn our love outward toward you and toward each other. May we live fully into your image and in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.